Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Chrysler. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 311 for November 20th of 2015. Something for everyone at the LA Auto Show. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific or 20 hours GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Welcome to AutoLine After Hours, coming to you from the Los Angeles Auto Show. We've got a great lineup of guests coming on today, talking about the new vehicles that they've got. Gary is here with me, as always. How are you doing? It's an exciting show. It's, uh, this is a better show, I think, than we expected to see. Far better, far better, absolutely. And then we've got to tell our audience that sitting between Gary and I right now is Kumar Gaholtra, the president of the Lincoln Motor Company, and we've had you on AutoLine this week, our TV show, but it's great to have you on After Hours, Kumar. Great, great to be here. Good to see you guys. So we got to jump right into it. You All guys right. are introducing the new MKZ at this show. That's correct. Right you, behind you. Right, right behind, behind you. you. You refreshed it considerably, but tell us a little bit about what the audience should know about this car. Well, it, as you mentioned, uh, it's got new uh, exterior design with the Lincoln Signature Grille. It's the, the same, new Lincoln Signature Grille. The new grill. Lincoln Signature Grille that you saw on the uh, Continental. This will be the first production car to have it, and then the Continental will have it, and then we will be bringing it to our entire portfolio. We've improved the interior and lots of intuitive technologies and, and a fantastic powertrain. Tell us a little bit about the powertrain. I think you got some impressive numbers, horsepower and torque-wise, right? We have uh, a Lincoln Unique uh, V6 bi-turbo, three-liter engine. Uh, it produces 400 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. But more importantly than the numbers, it is how it delivers that power and that torque. It's, it's, our customers are not about you know going wide open throttle as soon as the light turns green. This is more about abundance of power. Our customers told us that they want confidence inspiring, quiet, smooth, effortless power. So lots of power but delivered in a quiet luxury way. And all wheel drive. And all wheel drive, absolutely. Intelligent all wheel drive, the signature Lincoln technology and uh, uh, mat mat matched very, very well with this new engine. So, so this vehicle, from the design, it seems to me that just from changing the front end, it looks far more sophisticated than the previous generation car. And this MKZ is Lincoln's best-selling product. I mean, it really surprised me because I would have thought that the MKC, which is in the hot crossover segment, would yep. be would be doing better. And it's not doing badly, but I mean, this is is really doing well for you guys. What what explains that? Well, the, let's start with the segment. The mid-size luxury sedan segment is a very large segment in the luxury industry, and the small premium utility segment you're talking about is growing very fast, uh, which is where the MKC is doing very well. And uh, this vehicle is sort of a cornerstone vehicle for us. The, our entire journey of reinvestment in the brand started with this vehicle in 2013, and it's done very well, and it was time to refresh it. And we've got a, uh, a new look for it, a new interior, and uh, a new powertrain. Kumar, a number of people here at the show have said, why did Lincoln go away from that spread eagle kind of grill that you had, you know, where you had put it across the entire lineup? Right. I think the public was recognizing it. As somebody told me, is even if it's coming up in your rear view mirror, even at night you can tell that's a Lincoln. And now you've abandoned that. What's the, the thinking behind going with this new look? Well, that, that split wing grill you mentioned is a part of our heritage. Uh, it goes back to some really unique Lincolns. Um, and it's been a core part of our design DNA for a while. But I firmly believe, John, that for any brand, to stay relevant, you have to continuously evolve your design language. And it's always a fine line to walk. How much of evolution should there be and what direction do you go? Uh, so we thought very carefully about it and uh, we've gone with the, the design that you see. It's uh, been very well received, first in the Continental uh, and here as well. And in terms of family resemblance, as we progress this design across our uh, entire portfolio, the portfolio will have that Lincoln look to it. 
this will go on the crossovers and the SUV Absolutely. then too. Yes. Over time, it'll go through the entire portfolio. Gotcha. Now, on, on the inside of the car, you guys have done one thing which many of your competitors have not done, and, and I think you're going to get big applause from uh, your customers for knobs and switches yes. in the vehicle. Yes. So, was that the, the demand that you heard? We listen to our customers. <laughs> <laughs> we listen to our customers, we observe our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, customers can sometimes tell you only so much, but you actually learn a lot more by observing how they're using the car. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was clear to us that there are certain functions in the car the customers want to be able to perform without even looking, almost a blind operation. Right. And, and a knob for volume, a knob for tuning, a lot, knob for fan uh, speed control are the things that really, they, they use it very frequently mm -hmm. and they want to be able to do it almost intuitively. Right. And that's what we've done. So they hear, they hear a song they want, they just want to reach over, crank, reach, it, up, crank it up, and then they don't have to Absolutely. Well, so. kudos to you guys for listening because there's a number of other automakers out there that still think they want that high-tech, clean look, which you can get by taking the knobs off, but I'm with you guys, you know, you the know, knobs but I think, better. But, but I think what's interesting is, is, that, is that the technological sophistication that's still in that car is, is not absent. I mean, in, in the new center stack, the, the, you know, the, the aluminum center stack, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful, it's, it's sophisticated, but you know, it's instead of saying, okay, let's just do what Apple did and, and just get rid of everything, you guys have said, wait a minute, this is a car, this is not a cell phone, you're gonna you're gonna be operating it differently, and so let's let's make the ergonomics appropriate for the product. So what's really important to us not to do technology for the sake of technology. We love technology, there's tons of technology in this car, but all of that technology is being used to deliver an experience. So that moment in the car driving experience when you when your favorite song comes on and you want to turn it up that shouldn't be interrupted by how do i turn it up yeah, right yeah you know, exactly it's about right. the experience yeah. Yeah. so so that's what we're doing uh -huh. kumar when will this go on sale this goes on sale summer of 2016 next year okay so, so. in a few months away uh -huh. pricing going to stay more or less the same more or less the same, but we will uh, we will announce uh, pricing as we get closer to the launch. And are you keeping the hybrid version of it as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. Hybrid is a very important part of this vehicle. Uh, nationally, about 30% of the MKZ sales come from uh, MKZ hybrid. Uh -huh. In California, that number is 63%. Wow. So uh -huh. in certain states, it's very, very important. And this vehicle has really helped us in California. Uh, it's really fueled Lincoln's growth over the last few years. Our sales in California as a brand have doubled since 2010. That's saying something. That is saying something, yeah. Since 2010, Lincoln sales have doubled in California. And it's products like these that are responsible for it. So, very core product for us. That's great. And let's go back to the, uh, more of the styling sure. of the MKZ. It looks like, to my eye, just looking at it, it was really the front end. Did you really change all that much on the rest of it? There are some subtle changes in the back end. Okay. Uh, for example, the exhaust tips are wider. It's kind of a hint to the what's under the hood. Uh -huh. uh, on the interior, we've changed certain surfaces. Uh, we've introduced the uh, the Revel sound system, which is absolutely awesome. If you guys haven't heard it yet, I highly recommend it. One of the best music experiences. I have not ever. heard it in this car, but I have heard you it, have and heard it. it is impressive. It is. Yeah, you should get in this car. It's just, just tuned perfectly for it. Uh, and lots of other intuitive technologies. We've uh, introduced the auto hold button, which is great for stop and go traffic. Our uh, adaptive cruise control system was already very sophisticated. Now it has stop and go capability with it. We're also introducing the pre-collision uh, assist. So if the customer is unable or doesn't respond in time, the car will automatically brake uh, and hopefully avoid a collision or at least lower the severity of a co collision. Uh, and the pre-collision assist actually has pedestrian dis detection as well, which is, which is fantastic. So are you going to continue with the black label? Um, Absolutely, yeah. higher Higher trim. Um, yeah. But it's more than trim, right? It's, it's a, more, more of an experience for the... It's more than... Uh, absolutely. The experience begins with the shopping experience. So you can come to our, our dealerships that are Black Label certified. It's a different experience. Or if you want, we'll send somebody to your home with the, the swatches of the, the leathers and the mm -hmm. fabrics, uh, paint chips for the colors. Um, the, the interiors are gorgeous. The interiors have you know, just real beautiful wood, beautiful woods, sumptuous leathers. 
uh, Alcantara suede headliners. So the headliners. See, but it's not like the it's not like the the normal versions are in any way deficient. That's I mean, no, so you, guys, just you guys you amp it up an, way high. Yeah, amp it up way high. Really rich, uh, really rich materials. And then there's other, ex other experiences come with it. Uh, free pickup and delivery. So if you choose to come to our showroom for service, great. Or if you would prefer not to, we'll send somebody to pick up the car and get it serviced and deliver it back to your home. What, what uh, percentage of customers are going with the black label? Uh, it's early days because, again, it's constrained by the number of dealers that are black certified. Okay. Uh, when, the, when we have the right number of dealers uh, certified, it would still be in the single digit percent take rate, uh -huh. which is fine because the whole point of this is to be very exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're doing great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. And, yeah. uh, it's it's free anytime car wash. It is once a year detailing of the car. It's lots of benefits that Ooh, come with it. Now you're talking stuff that really resonates with me. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't have in to the go winter, in. man. Yeah. Geez. Get your car, car washed every day yeah. at the Black Label Certified Dealer. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Look, Kumar, uh, we're trying to do a whole lot of interviews right. with a bunch of people at this show. We're going to have to do a live guest change right now, but Fantastic. thanks so much for coming on. And I see my buddy Milton this. coming over. Yeah. Thank you for having me, guys. Very good. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much. Very good. Yeah, we've got uh, Milton Wong, the chief engineer of the, the Ford Escape, coming on right now because Ford chose this show to unveil the new look of the Escape. Mm -hmm. Hi. And Milton, John? welcome to Auto Line Gary? After Hours. Likewise. So How are you doing? We're doing great, and uh, you know, but we want to hear about the new Escape and what okay. you guys have done to it. Fourth generation. Fourth generation. But this is a major refresh, right? As this is a major refresh. As opposed to an all new architecture. Correct. correct, correct. So it follows architecture to 2013, but you know, we've done all new uh, lift gate, all new front end, all new rear end, and then a lot of upgrades to the interior and also the, the technology feature content and big stories, also our powertrains. And you're, you're picking up a whole new look. You're taking the, the look of the Ford Edge, if people are familiar with that. You can yes. see that on uh, the new Escape. Is that for the American market only, or is this going to be the one Ford style well, everywhere? Correct. So we're, we're starting with the American market, but you know our customers, uh, the customer base of the Escape, um, cross shops the Edge and the Fusion quite a bit. In right? the U.S. In the U.S. Right. Um, so, and all, well, you know that we're also bringing um, you know, edge into different markets. But our customer cross shops these vehicles, so naturally we think that this is the look that works for them, that they gravitate towards, you know, more of the front. Specifically the, the Kuga, as it's called in Europe, will it have the new look that we're seeing here? Uh, well, we're here to launch the North American product, okay. but uh, there are plans for the Kuga. Gotcha, gotcha. So we've talked styling. Tell us about some of the things that you went in under the skin and changed. Yeah, so, you know, from 2013, you know, our attribute story continues to be one of the key pride points for Ford and our Ford DNA, right? So since 2013, we've upgraded the rear suspension some to give it a better uh, comfort so that now you have the balance of precision, control, and the comfort now. Is that a, a tuning change? It's a tuning change. Okay. So it's... Um, uh, linear rate springs in lieu of the progressive rate springs. We've also upsized the rear dampers. And then all around the vehicle, you know, we've upgraded the NVH content. We've gone with laminated glass and insulated doors, you know, all to quiet down the vehicle. Which was already a pretty quiet vehicle. It was already a quiet vehicle, but you know, the customer always demands more, right? Of course. In this day and age, our customers equate quietness to quality, right? And you know, in this day and age, our customers just demand more and more, right? So those are some of the things that we've done relative to attributes to make it a, a very sound vehicle, or, or no sound, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's, it's smooth it's and it's smooth quiet and it's as quiet. it's moving down the but road. But there are things that you do want to hear, right? So for instance, door sound, uh, door closing sound quality. You want to, when you close your door, you want it to be vault-like, not not you know a rattly tin can. You don't right? want it to echo. Right? Yeah, resonate. correct, correct. You don't want the you know you don't want the, all the echo, the res you know the resonating of you know things that you hear as loose bolts or something like that, right? So door closing sound quality. So we've corrected the things in terms of what you don't want to hear plus the things that you actually do want to hear, right? The harmonization of of your chimes of what your door closing sounds uh -huh. like from both the interior and the exterior. And if we also talk about um, you know, beyond the attributes and the interior, we've made some major upgrades to the interior. So, so one of the things that you had told me beforehand, and that I hadn't realized, that in the 2013 model, it was a, a exclusive to Ford the lift gate that was opening by putting your foot on the Escape. Correct. 
and you guys have another technology that is a Ford first for any vehicle on this car. Tell us about that. Okay, so for the first time in Ford, we're introducing our Sync Connect technology. So Escape has always been a storied vehicle by which we launch technology. And for 2017, Sync Connect is that technology that we're gonna launch. So with Sync Connect, we'll be able to use our smartphone and be able to unlock and lock your vehicle um, we're going to be able to start the vehicle. We're going to be able to take a look at a map and find out where our vehicle is actually parked. And then also we'll be able to look at things like uh, oil pressure, um, oil levels, fuel levels, you know, some of the basic information and the vital stats of your vehicle. All through your smartphone from basically anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. We'll be connected through your smartphone into the cloud and into an embedded modem in the vehicle. And we'll be able to do and all this of this. this is escape only? This, for now, for now, we'll be rolling you're, it out. You're the first to get. We'll it. be the first to get it. And you know, it's tradition with Escape. We launch something new for Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you did another change in the inside of the car with the uh, elimination of the uh, handbrake. Yes. So, you know, the handbrake. You know, very typical technology, but we've upgraded it. We've taken away the mechanical park brake and put in an electronic park brake. You know, what that, what that really does for us is it really helps us to transform the entire interior for accommodation and usage, right? When we launched the 2013 Escape, it was a great vehicle. Everyone loved the way that it drove, the precision, the styling. But they also, the customers also told us we could do a little bit better with accommodation and usage. For, so 2017, by eliminating the big park brake, we were able to free up a lot of space so that now in we have- In the console area. In the console. Sure. You know, so now we can, if phones are getting bigger, take a look at the iPhone success, right? And you know, the new Samsung Galaxies. I mean, those phones are size of chunky. a piece of toast. Huh? Yeah. You know, they're chunky, right? My wife's sunglasses, they're getting bigger and bigger by the year, right? And the traditional places where we put those things, they don't fit, mm -hmm. right? So we've opened up all of that space to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Dang, no more handbrake turns. <laughs> well, you can, well. <laughs> so you got the little button. We have a little yeah. button. Powertrain, any changes there? Quite a bit, right? So we carry over the 2.5 liter TIVCT naturally aspirated engine, but the big news is that our existing two EcoBoost engines, we're gonna replace them with our new 1.5 liter EcoBoost engine and also our new two liter twin scroll EcoBoost. The real story with these two engines is that they're gonna come standard with auto stop start because we think that that's just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for the customer's wallet and it's also the right thing to do for the environment, right? It's, it's smart technology to shut off the vehicle when you don't need to use it. It's the right thing to do in Los Angeles traffic, that's for sure. That's definitely true. And, you know, we have this statistic where we say that, where we've calculated and estimated that the average American driver, you know, spends about 16 minutes idling and that equates to about 3.8 million gallons of gas wasted across the U.S. And, you know, I've experienced that here this week and, you know, a lot of sitting in traffic and, um, you know, but this is a smart technology. While we have these uh, congestion issues, just be able to turn off the engines. And, and when we do that, we're consuming zero fuel and we're burning zero emissions. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen estimates, at least in the U.S., that you can save about an average 8% or a boost fuel efficiency about 8%. Well, in city driving, right? depending on your uh, driving cycle, mm -hmm. we estimate that in a city driving uh, cycle, it's about 4 to 6%. Okay. So what's interesting is, is that you guys are making this standard. Yes. And, and, and there's also some, some huge statistic about how many escapes are likely to have echo boost engines. Yeah. So um, escape, we plan 90% of our volume You're to have kidding. echo boost engines. I had so, no idea. So 90% stop start on this vehicle. And that means we need to do stop start right. Right? We need to make sure that our goal is to make the technology nearly invisible mm -hmm. because we want our customers to use it. We don't want it to be that annoying technology where you get a lot of vibrations and a lot of goofy sounds. So we've tuned all of that. We've calibrated the system so that when the vehicle goes into a stop-start cycle, it's nearly invisible to the This customer. isn't one of those 48-volt ones, is it? No, no. It's Just a regular 12-volt. And, and I think it's interesting. Talk to us about the companies that you benchmarked when you were developing your start-stop system to make sure that it was transparent? Well, they're here, and I, I, all, all I'd say is that, you know, we've benchmarked some pretty uh, high marks, some of the luxury marks, and, you know, it's... it's I don't know about how that good a benchmarking that is. Some of them have had... I, I, this goes back a couple of years ago. Mm, they right. weren't so hot. True. Um, but, you know, so it's... I, I'd like to even take it away from the... Yeah, the luxury marks and being able to beat them in certain characteristics is, you know, it's a, it's a nice... It's a nice status to have, but 
the real important thing is that the customer benefits from all of this, right? It's that the technology and the vibrations and the sounds, it makes it nearly invisible to our customers. And that's what's really important, our customers in delivering a superb system for them that we know that they'll enjoy and that they'll like. And we have, you know, we have data on that based on, you know, some of the other stop-start systems that we have in, you know, in the marketplace today with some of our other products. You know, another aspect of this car that really astonishes me, or a crossover, I should say, is, is the fact that behind the F-Series, this is the Take second them out, best selling. Second best selling uh, across Ford. the board. Yeah, I, and that's a. Until you had said that, Gary, I, I, I was not aware of that. That's an amazing stat. Yeah. So each year we produce. Um, so in 2014, we're up at 306,000 units in North America. That's a big number. Yeah. 2015, we expect to beat that. Right. Out of our Louisville assembly plant, every 50 seconds we pump out another Escape, yeah. and that's 24 hours a day. So when are they going to start pumping out the new one? When will we see them in showrooms? We should see them and expect them in the showrooms in late spring, 2016. So you guys are going to have a, a bit of a challenge, right, with the model change? I mean, you know. Uh, Toyota's breathing right back. Yeah, I mean, they're not very far behind. They're they're going to be cranking up more production and all the like. Are you going to be able to hold on to the second best selling position that you have in the segment? Well, we're always going to compete for that. And you know, the way that we believe we do it is not to try to stay ahead of Toyota or not to try to chase Honda, but really what it's all about is trying to understand your customer, right? If we deliver, you know. People say, if you build it, they will come. No, but if you build it right, they will come, right? So, you know, our philosophy is, how do the customers use it? What do they want in the vehicle? We have to listen to them, right? And we also have to predict what do they want in their vehicles in the future? You know, things that they don't even know about right now or they can't even think of. It's our job as engineers to think about that ahead of time and deliver that to them. And that's how we're going to keep our pace, our sales pace, and keep our leadership in the segment. Real good. Milton, I love what you're saying. Focus on the, the customers. So Milton Wong, Chief Engineer with Ford Escape, thanks so much for coming on Autoline After Hours with us. Thank Great you, having you. Thank Can't you, wait to drive yeah. the new Escape myself. Excellent. I'm looking forward to your drive. Good deal. Hey, right. we got to take a quick commercial break. We give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. We're back, coming to you from the Los Angeles Auto Show. Right now joining us is Bob Broderdorf, the director of the Fiat brand in North America. Bob, great having you here. Thank you so much for having me. you got a big show here. You've got the new 124, and uh, i got to tell you, I love it. I, and, and the reason I say that is I hadn't seen any pictures, hadn't gone to any of the preview previews of what's going to be here at the show. As soon as I saw it, I went, that is a Fiat. And so what is it, what are my eyes seeing when I look at that besides the badge? If you pulled the badge off, I'd still say it's a Fiat. What are the cues? Well, I think really clearly and quickly is it pays homage to the original, the, the 1966 Spider that came out. And actually, the, the best-selling Fiat of all time in the, in the U.S. was the 124 Spider. So quickly, what you'll notice is some of the, the characteristics that came from that, the hexagonal grille up front, that long body side, that horizontal line that runs all the way over the fenders, and then clearly that convertible top that's so easy to use. That really is what made the original Spider so exciting and the fact that it's got the rear-wheel drive proportions with that big, long hood, small coach frame that makes the car look incredibly fun to drive. So, so, so people who are not Fiatistas, who are big, big fans of, of the brand, I think that when they think about it, they think of the 500, 500L, 500X. This is a complete departure from what, at least here in the U.S., we mainly know. What was the decision behind going for a car like this? Well, and Right now, one of the top purchase reasons for Fiat is fun to drive. I mean, one out of five people say that's the number one reason. And then now, if you look at really what the Spider delivers, it is a car that the only purpose is to deliver on fun to drive. I mean, nobody actually needs a two-seater convertible roadster. But if you want something that's thrilling behind the wheel and you're into cars at all, this is the kind of car that you'll enjoy. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what it'll do for the brand and provide a halo to all those consumers what Fiat's all about. Mm -hmm. It's no secret, of course, in the industry that it's the underpinnings are the Mazda Miata's uh, architecture. But you've managed to make this look 
quite different from the Miata and you're going to have your own unique powertrain. What other things did you really concentrate on to make this truly a Fiat? Yeah, so I think obviously we found an opportunity to formulate a great partnership and, and a platform that could deliver a Spider. But some of the things that are they're really different needed to deliver the characteristics of a Fiat. The vehicle's bigger in dimensions, we've got a longer hood, bigger trunk opening, but then the attention to detail and some of the things that we wanted to make sure that delivered that Italian craftsmanship. The noise cancellation that's been included into the vehicle, the acoustic sound of the windshield glass, the soft touch materials throughout the cabin, the leather wrap dash up front, as well as the lower passenger side, door panels, unique seats. We really wanted to leave the entire sensory experience and, and make sure that we delivered everything that was Fiat. And then obviously you mentioned the powertrain, the 1.4 liter turbo, a standard turbo, 184 pound feet of torque, uh, an engine and powertrain, the heart and soul of the car, designed and delivered right in Italy, put into that great platform. I think give is really the experience of something that's truly Italian and Fiat. So th this was designed in Italy, because the original was done by Pininfarina. Correct, yeah, that's and, uh, yes, so, yes, so, so. Fiat Ista there, yeah. So that was where the original concept came from, and what was a great challenge is to literally play on that. So you got in a car, like if you're gonna put a 124 badge on a car, it better deliver on some of the heritage. So our designers in turn did an amazing job of saying, okay, what were those key characteristics? Small things like what was the placement of the, the rear license plate? What did the grill, what did the headlamps, the tail lamps all do, and make sure that it still has that iconic image, but still do a modern interpretation. So so, so to be a contemporary vehicle, not not a throwback. Correct. Yep, and I, and I hope that's the uh, the message that we portrayed. And it's, it's sort of what you guys did with the, with the 500 as well. I mean, it's it's a it's a modern car, but it's unmistakably a 500. Absolutely. Yeah, and that was the goal. Mm -hmm. I've got to believe that a small two-seat sports car isn't going to sell in gigantic numbers, but I've got to believe one of the theories between, behind bringing out a car like this is it's just going to bring people into the showroom. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of people that are excited to see it. And I mean, if you're an auto enthusiast at all, anytime you get more rear-wheel drive two-seater roadsters inside the auto industry, I think that's a good thing, get people excited. And I think this car that people will aspire to, there might be some people that are on the fence that have always wanted to jump to a car like that, and perhaps maybe this is the car for them. Or do you think they'll come in to look at that car and maybe walk out with a 500 or 500X or something like that? Yeah, as we obviously grow the brand in North America, I mean, I think that's something that we currently see. Uh, all of the cars we try to bring to market uh, is to expand the lineup, expand the traffic that we get in the showroom. The 500X was a big part of that. Added an all-wheel drive, fully capable crossover that could reach the northern market, something that we were missing historically. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that'll happen. And we'll continue to work that over with all of the spider traffic we get. So you guys have been here for five years now. Correct. And how's it going? Uh, so, far, so far, we're proud of what we've done. And if you look at five years ago, zero dealers in the marketplace, zero awareness, zero car park. Now we've got a 45% awareness, got 208 dealerships established, we went from a speech to a brand in record time. So we've got a lot of positive things <laughs> coming together. I like that, a speech to a brand. But does Fiat need a volume car? It, you know, you, you've got sort of niche cars right now. Are, are you looking to get a volume seller for well, I, I think the volume car is the X. I really do. If you look at that segment right now, mm -hmm. you've got a number of entrants that are coming into the marketplace, all in that crossover space. All the, there's a ton of it. There's five five different ones that have all come in the last calendar year. So that's one of the fastest growing segments in the U.S. right now. So I think that can be part of our volume play. But one thing that's key for us is not just look. If we just absolutely hammer on the price and just sell volume, you absolutely can. But you're not going to be able to brand that way. You need to do it the right way and hit the pillars of the brand and, and do it intelligently. And I'll be the first to tell you we can sell more cars as long as we do it the right way, I think we're in good shape for the long term. So, so how do you, uh, since, since as you said earlier, you know, you started from zero, how do you attract new people into the Fiat showroom? What is it that, I mean, how are you reaching out to people who perhaps thought about a Chevy or thought about a Dodge or thought mm -hmm. about a Ford and, and to get them into Fiat. Yeah, the, uh, so if you saw the original strategy, right, we did big kind of wow factor marketing campaigns to get our unfair share of the market. And when you're only selling, you know, 3% of the segment, you need to do campaigns that are really grab some attention. Second is the experience. Uh, we do a lot of grassroots marketing, bring the cars to people and surprise them because they don't necessarily know to look for it. But when they get it, and I think they're surprised by, man, these things are really fun to drive. Great fuel economy, economical, affordable and the engineering that goes in to maximize space and cargo is really thoughtful. So mm -hmm. that's the stuff that I think uh, that we can do between just grabbing attention in general as well as just get people behind the wheel. Uh, I think that helps. I think See, it always, it always surprises me when I get into a, a 500, a, whether it's a 500X or a 500L uh, or the regular 500, is, is the interior is, is 
so well thought out in terms of it's colorful, it's playful, it's functional, and, and I don't see a whole lot of cars that are, are doing that the way that you guys do it. Yeah, you know, I, I guess for us when you're selling small cars, you have no choice but to deliver on very, very thoughtful, intelligent interiors. But yeah, I think that's one of the staples of the brand, and we try to do that with intelligent storage space, you know, pushing the wheels all the way out to the outside of the wells to maximize the interior cargo, really thinking about the ergonomics of where the passenger's sitting, and I think it's gone a long way. The mm -hmm. people who are driving them, I think, are pretty happy with it. Mm -hmm. When will we see the 124 in showrooms? I will launch in uh, Q2 of next year. So you'll have this 2017 model year next year in 16 in Q2. And price, can you give us any hint as to where it might fall, say vis-a-vis -vis the Miata? Right now we haven't launched any positioning or pricing, but uh, it's something a lot of people are excited to see. So, But I think what we need to do is continue to make sure that we take care of that fiat value equation and deliver something that I think is uh, appropriate for the car that our fiat customers come to expect. You said something interesting, 45% awareness. Mm -hmm. In five years' time, that's not a bad number, but it also indicates there's a whole lot of people out there, car buying people, who are not even aware that the fiat brand's there. How do you bring that up? Because advertising-wise, you guys are hitting home runs. I mean, you're doing ads that people are sharing just because they find them funny, mm -hmm. you know, amusing and uh, entertaining. Is it more advertising like that, or, or what do you do to build the awareness? I, I, I think it's twofold. So if you look at it, 45% awareness, my car's only playing 3.5% of the industry pretty good awareness pretty for good. such a small section of the industry. Mm -hmm. At the same time though, we've really built up, hey, the brand is here. They've known us for our commercials. But now it's really time to get into future benefits and some of the things, maybe part of the story we haven't told yet, of why somebody should really consider a Fiat. So I think that's part of the evolutionary tale, something that we can do to get more butts and seats. Hmm. So not just to entertain people, but sell more of the features on the vehicle itself. Yeah, I think that's part of it. You know it's Fiat, so we're definitely going to entertain you along the way and have some fun with it. <laughs> but nonetheless, I think the blocking and tackling part of selling a car, I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised about just how much a Fiat has to offer. So it, it seems to me in some ways you're in an advantageous space because it's a it's a European car, essentially, mm -hmm. right? And, and you are playing at a price point that is far different than most European cars. It's true, yeah. Charge. So, I mean, um, is, is there some way that that becomes a competitive advantage in the market? Yeah, I think if you look at stuff that's truly aspirational, cars that really make a statement about who you are, and then you look at the price points, a lot of those things are an ultra premium. Right. Fiat doesn't do that, right? So we try to bring those down to the masses where people can afford that, and we try to make a statement with the cars that we sell and sort of the, the statement that it is. So I think that's and, and uh, it, has, it is an advantage. You know, and it has technology. It isn't bare bones. I mean, it's it's. I mean, some people might think, oh, it's got a low price point. It's a European car. It just must have nothing. But but you guys um, have no, good yeah, technology. They're, they're, they're quite a stand. The 500X is a prime example. That even the the, the Spider today uh, is loaded with state of the art technology. The 500X just won the uh, top safety pick plus from IHS. It's loaded with blind spot monitoring, rear cross path detection, lane departure, automatic headlamps, or it's, uh, adjusting the lane. All of that technology in there. Whatever you'd expect the rest of the market. It's really great at an affordable price point. Mm -hmm. so. With that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Bob Broderdorf, thanks so much for coming on and tell yeah, us I all about so Fiat much. and the 124. I appreciate your time. So yeah, thank really you. enjoy it. Excellent. So we got to make a, a guest change right now. And uh, we've got Tony DeSalle joining us. He's the vice president of Buick and GMC for marketing and advertising. And this was also a big reveal mm -hmm. here very at the LA big, show. Very big. For, for Buick. Tony, hey good John, seeing you. How are you? I'm doing really hey, good. Good to see you. So we were just telling the audience, big show for Buick. At it is. It's a huge show for us here. Because you've got the new LaCrosse. We sure do. Yep. When was the old one launched? I mean, it was like back in the last century, it almost it seems. 2010. 2010? Yeah. yeah. Really? So it's only five years that the, the LaCrosse has been in this the market? This is a 17 model. Okay. So, yep. So... So our, our new lacrosse is a 2017. It'll go into production towards the second quarter and be available for sale in the summertime. Okay. See, see, John, I think what you're saying is that you saw this new one, and, I mean, it does look extraordinarily yeah. sophisticated and, and, and elegant. And you're saying, when was that other one out? I mean, it must have been way back when, because this thing looks... Like well, that. But it's it, not just that. It I is mean, all new. I, I mean, it is absolutely all new, a completely new architecture, low profile, a um, little bit wider stance. It's very efficiently packaged. You get a lot of interior for the amount of exterior. Um, it, I mean, is it bigger inside than the it outgoing is, It model? does give you a lot more interior space. So this is yeah. all new. It now, is this all is not new. a refresh. It, absolutely all new. Yep. Yep. 
So it's, so it's interesting that, that I hadn't realized that lacrosse is actually the number one selling car that, that Lincoln, or Lincoln, sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> Playing a road game here. Yeah, <laughs> at Buick has. At Buick yeah. has. And what, what accounts for that? Well, I think it, there's a lot of equity in the lacrosse name, and we have a very strong, loyal base that comes back. Um, and so that's been very, very helpful. But the other piece of it, and it'll be even more so with this new entry, is that this car will have the ability to appeal to kind of an upper mid segment as well. So it'll draw from a broad, broad base. And if you add up the midsize car segment, the large car segment, and Lux, we've got 3.7 million units. I mean, it is a huge, huge base. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know that there's a, a nice opportunity there mm -hmm. for this new car. Right, because I mean, for a while, it, it seemed that, that Verano, your small vehicle, was just you couldn't keep them in stock, I think. You were selling so many of them. And, yeah. And now that has that cooled significantly, and it just surprises me. Here is a large car yeah. selling well. Well, I mean, in the, in the case of Verano, um, that's, it has turned very quickly. I mean, our inventories are a lot lower than they, what, what they've been historically, so the car is turning fairly well. Um, but lacrosse is just a, it's a, it's a different uh, animal in itself in that, you know, it, it is more of a, a luxury kind of a play and consumers step up into it and it has, you know, this this new vehicle is going to be phenomenal. I can't wait to get you guys in it to drive it. And we I've can't had, either. I've ha had a, the pleasure of doing that and it is amazing. I mean, it really is because typically, you, I mean, you can improve, you can go after ride quality or you can go after handling, right? And that has always historically been a trade-off. With this car, we've been able to improve both. Um, via the new architecture and the lower profile and, and it gives you more confidence from a handling perspective but it has all the NVH qualities that you'd expect from us, from Buick. It's quiet, um, very comfortable, very smooth and, and, and it drives wonderfully. How are you going to market this? I mean, what, what are the attributes that you're going to point out to the public as to why they well, should get in? You know what, the, really the nice part about um, being at Buick in marketing is the first and most important attribute to our consumers is self-evident, and that's design. And uh, all you really need to do is show the car. Um, and so we've seen a lot of success. It's, it continues to be our top reason for purchase across the portfolio, portfolio today. So, and this car wins both on the outside as well as on the interior. Some really kind of unique design cues. I mean, uh, our eight-inch um, infotainment screen is frameless. So that's kind of a different look and a little bit more technologically progressive and and so we know from feedback from consumers it, it, most important thing is soak on the interior give a good view of the exterior and uh, that's going to be that's going to get you in the door um, mm -hmm. from a design standpoint yeah so I spent uh, some time this morning talking to Brian Nesbitt who yes. was is heading up uh, Buick design yep. now and uh, he, he was fairly instrumental in the new lacrosse Absolutely. and uh, you know, he was he was emphasizing that they wanted to lower the H point of this car, and then um, they moved the spindle forward so there's less front overhang than had been the case. So you're getting you were talking earlier about the efficiency, the, uh, efficiency and packaging, yeah. and uh, it it it, uh, it is very contemporary. Yes, and I think that's a it's a it, it big looks plus. it looks more dynamic. Mm -hmm. it, it really does, and and then. So we took the inspiration from the Avenir concept, which obviously you know we've we've seen internally for years, and we promised that. And we just saw design, Detroit at the auto right, show. Right, right, yeah, exactly. And so we promised that those design cues from the Avenir were going to come to fruition across the lineup, and Lacrosse is really the first one with the new grill and a lot of the lines from Avenir, and and so it, it is it's truly Avenir inspired, and Brian and team have had it ton to do with that. I mean, Brian's mm -hmm. been all over it. He's, mm -hmm. he's done a fabulous job. Gary just said an interesting thing, lowering the H point. We're seeing yes. in the rest of the industry, everybody raising their H point, the hip point where you sit, yep, yep, because everybody loves that crossover kind of feel. Yep. Why lower it? Well, to do what I just said, to, do, to be able to do both from the standpoint of being able to drive improvements, not only in, in quality of ride, mm -hmm and comfort of ride, but also to drive improvements in handling. So that lower H point gives you more mm -hmm. confidence going around corners. And and it, it lives up to the exterior expression of the car, right? Because the exterior expression is much more much more dynamic than, right. than the previous. You know, and model. one thing that Brian said to me about doing that was the fact that he's saying, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna have a sedan and you're gonna wanna have a sporty sedan, you gotta do that. So let's give people a reason to want to get into this car yep. rather than, than having a, a artificially high H point just to satisfy uh, aging hips. But you could, <laughs> 
but 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 you but you guys have crossovers. I mean the 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 on you know the encore is doing encore's great. going gangbusters. Yep. And yep. Uh, the enclave is still yes. hanging in there strong. That's right. Yeah, enclave will probably set yet another sales record. And um, so obviously we've capitalized on growth to crossovers, but um, we've been these two have been very successful for mm -hmm. us. Yep. Yeah, what else does Buick have to do then? You guys have moved the needle well, this year. You've got, you've got yeah. another car coming. We've got Cascada. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the convertible. Convertible, that's right. Well, when's that coming out? Well, we, we've be, seen that forever, it seems. Well, it seems like it because yeah. we introed it at Detroit last year. but um, This that's year, right. actually. Well, that's right, yeah. 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 We're in the second I another know, auto, I cycle, know. auto show cycle, and I'm right. thinking last year. No, but you're absolutely right. And so that'll be that's just months away now. Okay. And they will be in showrooms. And I really like our chances there. I really do because a lot of players have vacated that space. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a fashion purchase. So there are convertible, dedicated consumers that aren't necessarily brand loyal. There's they're convertible a, they're loyal. They're convertible loyal, and they want the latest and greatest. And you know, let me let me see what what's new. And I think we've got a great opportunity to pull more people into the Buick franchise via that entry and it's also just a wonderful halo i mean we're about unexpected surprises and and that's a, a great example of it yeah i think you do have a chance uh, of pulling people out I, I i can tell you on a personal basis one of my brothers uh gave up buying uh, Lexus and they've got a, an old lacrosse. So maybe you got a chance to even get them in a new well, one good. too. Yeah. But are you seeing that happen more now where you're getting conquest sales? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, our, I was just looking at our most recent conquest data. So non-GM source of sales is now up to 46% for Buick. That's up four points in, in the last year. And so that is a metric that has just continued to grow. And that's a pretty good number when you consider how broad the GM portfolio is, um, all, including our sister brands. Uh, to well, what's doing it? Is it just offering a broader lineup of vehicles? Is it it's your a broader? It's a broader lineup of vehicles. It's having a couple of crossovers that are, are uniquely placed in the market, um, and capitalizing on that. And quite frankly, it, it also has a lot to do with our communications and the success of the advertising campaign and really putting Buick on many consumers' radar screens by you know, taking a very honest, down-to-earth approach and using some self-deprecating So, so the, the poking and, fun at, that's a Buick yeah. or, you yeah. know. Or not uh, a Buick, or, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 because everybody seems to be, even those that are, are closer to the brand, seems to be surprised by the product portfolio. I mean, it's we've got the goods, and, and the, one of the nice things about it is the closer that you get to Buick, the more that you like it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter, from a product standpoint, it's just a matter of converting people from the standpoint of their perceptions. And what can you tell us on how you're changing the demographic of buyers coming in? Um, it, it's broadening, for sure. I mean, it is a younger buyer than what we've seen historically. I think our average age is down six or seven years in the last five years of business. That's huge. So, yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, it's it's getting a lot closer to just industry average um, average age. And, so, and it's also uh, a little bit more upscale than it's been. Um, historically, but uh, with that having been said, we also have Veranos and we've got Encores that play at the lower end. So we have an ent we have entry points in the portfolio that Buick hasn't had in a long, long time, if if ever before, in terms of very quality entry doors into the Buick brand. Real good. Look, Tony, it's been great having you kind of come on here, t talk all about the new lacrosse, what you're doing at Buick. Uh, yeah. Looks to me like you're doing things right because. Uh, Sales are going up. I think you're gaining a little bit of market share. Yes, we yeah we we are. Yep, yep. Well, good. Look, thanks so much for coming on Autoline After Hours. We really thanks, love John. having you here. Yeah. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, we got to take another uh, quick break Thank here. You. We're going to be back talking about all the different vehicles, the new ones that were unveiled at the show. Don't go away. We're gonna take this break uh, from our good friends at Chrysler. There is no royal blood in this country. Nothing is reserved for anyone. It's all just out there, waiting for someone to reach out and take it. And the ones who do, these are the kings and queens of America. We're back from our break here at the Los Angeles Auto Show. Joining us right now is one of our colleagues, Anton Wallman, writing for Chasing Alpha. We'll get into that in a little bit, but Anton, welcome to Autoline After Hours. Good to be here. And no, 
special part of the show that we get to every time. Dr. Data is in the house. All right. Gary, let's hear your number. All what right, you so got? you're here at the LA Auto Show, right? And so the number is two. 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 I can count to that. Okay. And uh, so the 2015 Urban Mobility Scorecard came out, and this Texas A&M does this study, and uh, they work with Inrex, the uh, navigation software company. And they have calculated that LA is the number two most congested city in the United States, that people spend 80 hours a year in traffic jams, which is 3.3 days just sitting there waiting. So, you know, these cars had better be damn comfortable if you're going to sell a car in Los Angeles. So LA's number two, what's number one? Washington, D.C. Really? Where, where people spend uh, 82 hours sitting in traffic jams. And, uh, and number three, keeping it California, San Francisco, the part of the world that you're from, Anton. And uh, you only spend 78 hours sitting in traffic jams. Well, that is less than, you know, the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., clearly, where the growth of the federal government has been linear to the uh, availability of air conditioning in, in, the, in the 1930s. That's right. So they're suffering from that right now. And they're buying air-conditioned cars, and so, uh, and so it continues. So what have, what have you seen at the show, Anton, that uh, you think is significant? We've, 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 and we should point out that John and I often mention you during the show, so I think our, our viewers are familiar hearing about Anton and... This is the famous Anton. Not sure yeah, whether it's a good or bad gonna, thing, but... No, now we're going to say good things about you. <laughs> okay. With you sitting here. Uh, I think there are precious few things, to be honest, that have been shown that have broken new ground. Um, I think that, honestly, the biggest announcements aren't actually with respect to any specific car, but with the couple of announcements that have been made on the electric car charging front, both with respect to standards and interoperability and some limited network build-out all of which are very nice to have, but they are simply not sufficient and not of the scale, monetarily or otherwise, that one would like to see. So what are these announcements? These are announcements centered around BMW and uh, ChargePoint and the various interoperability between the electric car charging networks and the limited build-out of 50 kilowatt hour DC chargers that are being done up and down the five interstate between Portland and San Diego, and I think something of a slightly smaller scale on the East Coast as well. So nice little steps, not nearly far reaching enough that I think will be necessary to drive adoption of these vehicles. In so fact, there's no talk of electric vehicles at this show, as you, as you I mentioned. I think that the biggest one is happening as we speak, and that is Audi. I mean, they have clearly turned things around in a major way to promote what is going to be a major offensive on their part starting in about two years when the e-tron quattro goes into production in that plant in Belgium. And, and this is an offensive against whom? Well, uh, presumably, I mean, argue, but look, the big name is, of course, large SUV Tesla Model X. But between now and then, keep in mind that the big dogs that will enter the race are on January 5th, Mark Royce just confirmed an hour or two ago, Mary Barra will announce the Chevrolet Bolt at CES, not at the Detroit Auto Show. Ooh. Not at the Ooh. Detroit Auto Show, but yeah. at CES. And uh, sometime thereafter, several months thereafter, we will see the Nissan Leaf 2.0, which will have presumably roughly similar performance. So be before that so Audi actually... 200 mile range they were talking about. Park in that, we'll, we'll have to see, but... That's what 180 to 200, Lord knows. We'll, we'll in that range, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so we saw that we saw the Bolt at the Detroit show. The concept, the concept. Form, so correct. this will be the production version of the Bolt. So it's, they say. All right. So, but we're in Los Angeles, and we need to talk about what we've seen here. So, John, what have, what have you seen that that really? Well, you know, uh, let's start with the Cadillacs. We uh, are, I, I should say, the Cadillac, the CT5. Their crossover that replaces XT5. XT5. Excuse me. Nobody I, can remember these things. I know. What about Fleetwood? Yeah. What about uh, yeah. what other good names? They've had Seville. Eldorado. Yeah, right. If they have an electric car, why on God's green earth did that not call it the Eldorado? The electric Dorado, if nothing yeah. else, right? <laughs> right. So you're right, XT5. So, uh, look, a lot of people are criticizing the, the styling of it. I think it looks pretty good, but I've learned I cannot judge the styling of a car in the artificiality of an auto show with harsh lights on it set up on a pedestal. I know I've got to see this thing out on the street. Mm -hmm. I think it looks great inside and out. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. I uh, we have a new Elantra that was introduced uh, 
this afternoon? Yeah, you know, I think uh, Ford and Kia are all trying to see who can come up with the exact same grill design at the same time. Maybe not exact same, but I, I think for the public, this is going to start to generate confusion. If you look at the, the grill on the new Escape and, uh, and the Edge, very similar to what you might see on the Elantra and uh, the new Tucson John, as well. the focus groups don't lie. They've all come to the same conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> of that trapezoidal grill. That's right. That's a, there's something in human nature that has devised that this is the optimal styling. Mm -hmm. There's no other reasonable conclusion that we can make. I was, I was a little surprised that the, the Elantra, when, when the current generation came out, that they really upped the ante in terms of the design quotient. I mean, they really took it far. This one, it seems to be more dialed back. And, and uh, so as, as you recall that back then they were talking about fluidic sculpture, that was their design language. And then the new design language is fluidic sculpture 2.0. But during the introduction, and Peter Schreier was there from uh, HQ, um, little talk of fluidic sculpture 3.0. No, because or... fluidic sculpture started when uh, Joel Piskowski was running design. Mm -hmm. And when you get a new design director, what the old design director did generally gets tossed out the window because they don't want to be talking about what somebody else did. They want to show what they've created. Mm -hmm. This is just what happened with the Sonata, right? The previous generation was very advanced. I particularly didn't care for it. The new one came out. It's not being criticized for being overly conservative. I think it looks somewhat almost kind of OK. It's as bland as it gets. If you want to get lost in a parking lot, buy that car. Not to say that it's ugly, it just isn't. It's not standing out. No, it's and not I, all I, that I think it's not as Baroque as the uh, original one was. No. I mean, on the other hand, they've got the other side of the house, Kia, which has very expressive designs. The new Sportage, I think, personal is an absolute knockout on every front. Speaking of design knockouts, I'm sure you saw the Mazda CX-9. That's a knockout on every front, inside, outside, and otherwise. I mean, they have, can you think of another automaker that has nailed the design from the smallest car to the largest sedan, SUV, and anything in between. These guys are on the message, and it is a, a design language that is going to last the, the, the test of time. Well, arguably, it already has, because, I mean, they have many, many variants of that Kodo design language out on, in terms of vehicles. So this is the that, last one. This is the one but, completed the cycle. Right, but I mean, so, so you know, you think about it, you get the Mazda 6, you got the CX-3, the small uh, crossover, know, the MX. I but sales are going nowhere. They're losing market share. But, you know, I, but I don't it, understand okay, but, it. but isn't it interesting that, that this is a small, scrappy company mm -hmm. that is willing to say, you know what? We're going, to, we're going to put out these fantastic designs. We're going to develop technologies that will make our vehicles all the lighter. We're going to develop you know, powertrains that are so much more efficient. I mean, I don't know how they do it. I mean, and I give them a whole lot of credit. I, I totally agree with you, and I love their cars. I love their HMI. I loved how simple their technology is to use, and it's just not moving the needle with the public. Well, they're not there. losing they're market share either. No, they're losing market share. Really? Yeah, year I mean, to date. Yes. We don't have the blue notebook, so we can't go to it. So that's back in Detroit. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> but I mean, what, what, I, I think what's, what's interesting is, is perhaps what it is, is that Mazda is spending so much of their, their, their funds on engineering and design that marketing is getting short shrift. I mean, I mean, when's the last time you saw a Zoom Zoom commercial or? I was or, at the headquarters three weeks ago in Hiroshima. That building is from 1931. The interior with the, I think the desks and the seats were from roughly the same time period. Linoleum floors. That's right. They certainly haven't spent money on some things. And they said, look, we want to focus on spending the money on where we need to beat the big but guys. I think Gary, that is R &D. And I, I, but I think Gary's got a good point. They've, they've done the engineering job. There's no question. They've done the design job. There's no question. And they have the agreement with Toyota for the advanced powertrain technology. Long interview with the CEO. He doesn't believe in any form of electrification. Says we've got to have it. We'll get it from Toyota, but you know the cars don't make a noise. They don't smell like a real car. He doesn't like it. Self-driving car doesn't like them either. They'll make you lazy behind the wheel. When you go get older, you'll not be able to keep up with learning to pay attention. So I think that they are. They may be a, one of the more conservative entries in the field. I wonder if Volkswagen's faux pas here opens the door for Mazda, because Volkswagen's always been fun car to drive. 
and Mazda's tagline is even driving matters. Right. Boy, if I were the head of marketing at Mazda, I would go right for Volkswagen's throat and say, bring your Volkswagen in and we'll give you an extra discount on buying a new Mazda. So we also saw the uh, Civic Coupe was unveiled here. We've seen the sedan and uh, now they've unveiled uh, the production coupe. What's your sense of that? Beautiful, I haven't driven it yet, but uh, it's beautiful and it has Android Auto and Apple CarPlay standard on every reasonable gr uh, grade. And um, the fuel economy is there. I, What else can you want? See, I don't agree on the beautiful side, and I love the Civic. In, in fact, for my vote... The coupe. The four-door, I would agree with. The four-door looks actually, a little uh, bit off. The I, I, coupe, on the no. other hand, is much nicer. Well, I, I, I think that actually the four-door looks better. And as I was uh, saying, uh, you know, right now I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to vo vote for North American Car of the Year. My, my Civic, or the Civic's on my short list for sure. But, boy, I, I don't like their styling. I, I, I don't like any of Honda's styling, for that matter. I, I think they could do a whole lot better. And they're losing market share for sure. Now, part of the reason is they only go after retail sales. They don't touch fleet whatsoever. I think that's a, another mistake of theirs. But, boy, I... I, I think they could really See, do... See, but their customers are happy with the high residual values because they don't go to fleet. Th no, that's absolutely true. Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to knock the company. They're, they're very successful. But I sure would like to see them do a better job in styling. So we all drove the Prius in recent days. Mm -hmm. It's a much better car. Oh, so, my gosh, is it better. But here's, think about math and some data. The thing starts at $25,000, including destination. The Volt starts at 34000 It gets a $9,000 benefit from federal and California state combined. The LEAF <coughs> starts at 35,000 with a 170 mile range that gets $10,000. So both of the, all three are net of tax incentives, 25 even. Two of those cars at California carpool lane. The LEAF, Not, the LEAF, the Leaf and, the, and the, Volt. the Volt. The Toyota does not. If I were Toyota, I would be unhappy with this situation. They have done, made a car that costs fundamentally less to make gives you over 50 miles per gallon in most circumstances, almost all circumstances, and they get completely hosed on the and, legal and that's, front. And, and that's because they were too successful? Arguably, well, I mean, but that's, you can I mean, say that's that why you don't get the, the sticker, Washington, right? Washington, D.C. and Sacramento, California are favoring a certain technology and are showering those two with $9,000 and $10,000 respectively, plus carpool lane right, access, that's... which we have established accounts for something on the ballpark of 40 percent of purchase motivation for those vehicles. For those vehicles. I asked Toyota about that though, if they saw any drop off in sales when the the Prius no longer qualified for that sticker to get in the HOV lane, they said they really didn't see much yeah, difference. Yeah, but they, they, there was a little trick to, to that and that is when, when that happened, that was actually before the Volt and Leaf actually hit the market. So there was a year or two in between there. So in that time, the Prius really had no competition. So as it happened in that time, I, I'm pretty sure they did not see any drop off. And then came those other cars and we have seen the Prius decline, granted, late in the model cycle. Late in the model cycle. So, so John, you were you were very critical of the last time you drove a Prius. No. Not, not, not last I hated week. It. You I hated the outgoing model, and which is very interesting because when it first came out, I was very impressed by the car. And I got in one, really, probably about four or five years later, knowing the new one was going to come out this year, I thought, ooh, I better get in a Prius because I haven't been in one recently and I got to reacquaint myself with it. And I thought Toyota would have Kaizen this thing to a heart, you know, to a fairly well. And in fact, in my opinion, the car was cheapened up. It wasn't as good. So I, I think the new Prius is a significant improvement on the outgoing model. And that was largely suspension and powertrain or? No, quietness, NVH. You know, uh, I was going 80 miles an hour down the highway, having a very normal conversation, normal voice level conversation. All of which is true, but compare it back to back with the new Volt. I will take the Volt any day in terms of overall NVH, power, power delivery, interior, the whole thing, except for 10 miles an hour, th hours worth of top speed. Nobody in this country really cares whether it's a 100, 110. The acceleration in the Volt is far greater. The only advantage the Toyota has is really just rear seat room, which is a little bit better, and just a little bit better now. Well, see, I, I would, I would 
I would be the opposite of you. I, I think that the Prius is better than the new Volt, and I've driven both both vehicles. Um, I, I was I'm, I'm still underwhelmed at the non-battery performance of the Volt. I mean, once you once you lose that 53 miles, then you know you're you're dealing with not very good fuel efficiency. I got better fuel efficiency out of the, uh, oh, the yeah, Civic. Oh yeah, clearly. But you're carrying just being around normal. the heavy battery. What'd you get in the Civic? Do you remember? I was getting over 40. Yeah, I got 39 miles to the gallon for over a week's driving, and I was hoofing it everywhere. Right. Last week was a really hectic week for me, and I was running everywhere and foot into it all the time, and I got 39 miles right. to the gallon. Right. I mean, and I was so, so it's like, why would I? Why would I buy? A, you know, why would I buy a Volt? I'll tell you exactly and, uh, why. Because you'll be driving the Volt 90% of the time on no fuel whatsoever. Yeah. That's the thing. So 90% of the time, you won't consume a drop, so there is no MPG. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Yes, you get 42 miles per gallon once your electricity is down to zero, once the battery is drawn down. But until that point, you might be running on battery mm -hmm. over 90% of the well, time. Well, I, I still veer from you. If all else so, fails, so speaking of the Prius, so, so speaking of the Prius, <laughs> it has the the Toyota next generation architecture underlying it, and this is this is doing it good things. And we just saw that Scion came out with a new concept vehicle, the CHR, the Compact High Roof Line um, Crossover Compact Sports Car. Um, it looks similar to the Nissan. Uh, uh, no, the Nissan concept car that they introduced in uh, Frankfurt. Oh. Grips, G R I P Z. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Similar basic concept idea. So, so basically, when do you hear a car company introduce a concept vehicle and say that it has a production architecture underneath it unless they're planning on building that car? That's right. So, I, I looked to see that next fall. They may also want to emphasize the fact that they will be able to produce the car at a lower cost, pointing to improvement to the bottom line pointing to their shareholders that we are not wasting your money, we are utilizing the most efficient architectures that we can come up with. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and this this is to your point of the Kaizening of the whole thing, but I mean, they, they are now saying, okay, let's let's leverage our strength. Yeah, and, and look, uh, you know, the rest of the industry better watch out. Toyota is already the number one automaker in the world by sales. It's already the number one automaker in the world by profitability and by revenue, I believe. And now they've got this new architecture that they think is going to save them all kinds of money and give them more flexibility. Wow, mm -hmm. what's the rest of the industry do? All right, I have a question for you. So, so we heard about the uh, Cascada, which will be the Buick convertible. Um, we're seeing the Evoque convertible here. Now, is, is this the answer to a question that no one has asked? That's true. I think it is the answer to a question no one has asked. Look, it's a cool vehicle. It's cute. You know, if I lived on uh, the Côte d'Azur or something like that, this would be the vehicle. I just don't see them selling a whole lot of these things. So, so you're saying the, the Murano Cross Cabrio would not be your vehicle <laughs> of choice? I mean, that worked out I've so well. I've seen two in my life. This worked out so well for them, didn't it? So what's your take, Anton? Is, it, is, is the Evoque convertible going to be a big seller out here? No? You got to talk for the podcast people. For the podcast, people. For the podcast yeah. people, he's shaking his head. Yeah. No, I think right. we can safely uh, discard that one. I, I think that one is off the chart. So why did they do it? Because they had the car and they figured, well, we got this Sawzall and we don't know what to do with it, so let's just cut the top off the car? I guess at some point, the designer look, I mean, gets I, thrown a chip and say, look, you can do whatever you want. Look, everybody's trying to discover the next white space that's out there. As you know, all the product planners have this grid pattern and they lay out all the products and all the segments and they go, hey, look, there, there's a little piece of white space here. Let's put something in there. And it's like, well, we don't have a whole lot of money to tool. What do we do? And to your point, Gary, you go get the hacksaws. And well, you, Jeep, most successful car company currently in terms of performance, in terms of sales. They got the Wrangler. Toyota killed the FJ Cruiser. Yeah. Don't you think they want it back at this point and say we can do something like the Jeep? I mean, don't you think GM is regretting killing the Hummer at this point? I mean, these are all things that people killed in a hurry, and now if they had it and had updated them and under the, you know, chassis-wise, engine-wise, would be selling very well. They probably would. So the, the, the motto of the show is never give up. Just keep improving.
Well, I mean, I, and I think that, I mean, overall, um, for people who are interested in automobiles, I think this, this show is, is great from the point of view that there is no one dominant theme that, you know, everybody is going like lemmings in a certain direction. There's, there's a, a vast variety of, of technologies and approaches. There's the small Fiat 124 based on the, the MX-5 Miata, and there's the larger CX-9 um, Mazda. There's, you know, the, the new... Uh, Look for for the uh, um, MKZ. We've got you know a, an all new uh, Buick LaCrosse. I mean, it's, it's just all over the place, and uh, I think that's something fantastic. for everybody. It's, it's fantastic, absolutely. Except no new pure electric car at the show. Production. Then, then you could say, well, and there's no new pure pickup truck. Fair point. So. But this is California, and this is the land that's really pushing EVs more than other. I think what you're saying, Anton, is kind of significant. No brand new pure EV at the, the show. The closest we can get is what we're seeing okay. across the aisle here, which is the Honda fuel cell one, which is insignificant anyway for other reasons. Are they saving it for CES, though? One company is, two companies are, Chevrolet and Volkswagen. So, so the, big, the big volume players are waiting until January. For whatever reason, the answer is yes. And then when is Ford going to make their move? The Model E is somewhere in the wings in concept form. We will see it at some point. I have no earthly clue when, but when it comes, I think it'll be significant, if nothing else, for the name. Yeah, exactly right. Hey, with that, we're going to wrap this up. Anton, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Yeah, it's been great having you on. We're going to have to do this again. And Gary, Absolutely. great being with you as always. Hallelujah. Hey, next week is Thanksgiving. We're going to be off for that. We hope you all have a great Thanksgiving yourselves. We'll be back here in two weeks with a very special show coming to you from the media launch of the new Nissan Titan. We invite you to join us then as always, and thanks for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Chrysler. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.